Today we're looking at over 15 music Mandela effects. So what is a music Mandela effect? It's a strange circumstance where a large group of people remember something differently than it is now. When it comes to music, the lyrics you've known forever could have changed. Or perhaps the most terrifying example is a song you knew before might not actually have ever existed in the first place. We're talking about all of these examples and more. Remember, the fun of the Mandela effect is that we don't know what causes it or why some people are affected by some changes and others aren't. It's a strange mystery, but that's why I love talking about it. Today I'm covering a mixture of new examples as well as ones I've covered in the past combined into one massive music journey for you to enjoy. Topics today include Michael Jackson, Britney Spears, The Beatles, Ice Cube, Barbie, Christmas music, and so much more. Timestamps are in the description below, so like, subscribe, click that notification bell, and check out my Patreon to help me keep the lights on. Let's get into some music Mandela effects. To kick this off, I'm going to give you a bunch of band names and a record, and I want you to tell me what is the correct name. Sounds easy, right? Let's see how you do. The Eagles, The Carpenters, The Ramones, The Bee Gees, The Dark Side of the Moon, or Eagles, Carpenters, Ramones, Bee Gees, Dark Side of the Moon. Look at this list, think them over. Pause now if you need more time. The correct answer to all of these are the ones that don't include the. That's right, the word the. For whatever reason, the word the has created a lot of confusion and debate among fans of many bands. So tell me, do you remember the being used in front of any of these, or did you get them all correct? Next up, let's talk about the Mamas and the Papas 1965 hit, California Dreaming. Which of these is the correct line from the song? I began to pray, or I pretend to pray? Well, as it turns out to the disbelief of many online, it has always been pretend to pray, not I began to pray. Is that what you remember? Next up is Billy Joel's 1973 classic song, Piano Man. Which do you remember? A memory, a melody. Apparently many believe that the lyric is melody, but it's actually memory. Which one did you recall? Here's a fun one that's been freaking people out. Think back to the 1995 song, who Will Save Your Soul by Jewel. Every time she says soul in the song, does she say soul or souls? The obvious answer is soul, and that this was simply me testing you and keeping you on your toes. Except not. She actually never says soul in the song. She says souls every single time. Tell me, is that what you remember? The last smaller effect I want to talk about before getting into the bigger topics is the song Boom Boom Pow by Black Eyed Peas. What is the correct lyric? I'm so 3008, you so 2000 and late. Or, I'm so 2008, you so 2000 and late. The lyric is, I'm so 3008, you so 2000 and late. Now let's dig into some more in-depth music Mandela effects. Please enjoy. Recently on the television show Wheel of Fortune, a contestant had to solve a puzzle for a song lyric. Sweet dreams are made of blank. The contestant got it wrong and lost a potential $4,000 extra in winnings, but luckily went on to still win the episode. What was his answer? He said, sweet dreams are made of these. The correct answer is apparently sweet dreams are made of this. The lyrics come from a famous 1983 Eurythmics song titled Sweet Dreams. This caused a ton of confusion online, leading to multiple articles being written about not just this contestant losing, but also about how this lyric has been misheard for decades. That detail right there is what really interests me. The articles written didn't solely exist to make fun of the guy for saying the obviously wrong word in the puzzle. It's that even the writers of the article thought it was, sweet dreams are made of these. Once I read a few of these articles, I couldn't stop researching this. How is it that so many people could have misheard this song lyric for so many years? And it begs the question, is it really as simple as everyone is misremembering the lyrics? Or is this a Mandela effect? I'm curious to hear what you all remember. In the song by the Eurythmics, the way this is said is extremely exaggerated. So perhaps that exaggeration is the cause of all this confusion. But I read multiple comments of people saying that these sounds better than this, especially with the flow of the song and the rhyming of the song. So what do you think about this? One of these articles that I read, the top comment underneath it was, Sweet dreams are made of this? I was today years old when I learned that these isn't the correct lyric. One last detail I bring up about this is the Marilyn Manson cover of this song, where the debate continues to rage. So I gave the song a listen with headphones on, and it does sound like these, but the lyrics for it say this. It's just weird. Is this all misremembering or mishearing, or has something actually changed? Let's talk about Lamb Chop, the strange but lovable sock puppet sheep. Lamb Chop was voiced by the late and great Sherry Lewis. 
Now, this puppet had a preschool TV show that ran from 1992 to 1995 called Lamb Chop's Play Along. The reason I bring up Lamb Chop is because of an iconic song that anyone familiar with Lamb Chop would know. The song is called The Song That Blank Ends. That is today's Mandela Effect. What is the name of that song? Is it The Song That Doesn't End? Or is it The Song That Never Ends? The correct answer is, shockingly enough, The Song That Doesn't End. Is that the title that you remember? Because that doesn't sound right to me. Strangely enough, if you look up this song on Google, most of the videos for this song are titled The Song That Never Ends. One of the few videos that I could find that actually had comments turned on was on Facebook. And that comment section was filled with confused people asking if anyone else remembers the song being Never Ends, not Doesn't End. Even the title of the Facebook video was The Song That Never Ends. I listened to the entire song and it never says never. That's pretty weird if you ask me. So what do you remember? Is it the song that never ends, or have you always remembered it as the song that doesn't end? The song I Love Rock and Roll was originally released by The Arrows in 1975 and again by Joan Jett and the Blackhearts in 1982. The reason I bring this up is because one of the lines in this song has allegedly changed. The first version of this song is about a woman, and the second version of the song is about a man. So to simplify things, we're just going to go with the Joan Jett version. The line is, quote, I saw him blank by the record machine. What are the missing words? Sing it over in your head and then take your pick. Is it standing there or dancing there? A ton of people were freaking out online over this. Most of them seem to remember the line being, I saw him standing there by the record machine. But it turns out that's incorrect. It's dancing there. I'm not a massive fan of this style of music, so my input here wouldn't be very helpful. But I know that a lot of you are, and this Mandela Effect seems to be pretty controversial. That's why it's included today. What do you remember? Has it always been dancing, or does standing sound better to your memories? As always, let me know below. I love reading everyone's comments, thoughts, and opinions. Next, let's talk about a much more modern type of art. The Milk Mustache. The Got Milk advertising campaign, which ran from 1993 to 2014, was created and used to encourage the consumption of milk in the United States of America. What started as simply an ad in California, later was licensed by milk producers and dairy farmers all across America, all with the express goal of selling more milk. What was really strange about these ads were that they used numerous celebrities, musicians, and athletes to sell milk. And in each of them, they always had a milk mustache. Weird, right? What a strange time in American history. Although, as weird as it is in retrospect, I was a kid and a teen at the time, so I never really stopped to consider how strange any of this was. Anyway, let's talk about the Mandela Effect. A bunch of female famous rock musicians at the time did Got Milk ads. People like Kelly Clarkson and Miley Cyrus. But the weirdest one is the one that apparently no one can find today. And that is the Got Milk ad with Avril Lavigne, the pop punk singer and songwriter that tons of people remember, myself included, but apparently has never existed. The limited details that people have recalled is that she had a white cotton tank top on, apparently suspenders, and that her guitar was in the photo. But that's about it. Go ask anyone who was alive during that time if they remember her doing a Got Milk ad, and more than likely, they will say they remember it. But as far as we can tell, it doesn't exist, and apparently never did. Here's the crazy thing. The Got Milk ads had reached a 90% awareness in America, which is phenomenally successful, meaning 9 out of 10 people had heard of or at least seen one of these Got Milk ads. So the chance of someone seeing one of these ads over the 20 plus years they were made is extremely high. That's what makes this specific Mandela effect so interesting. We have a list of everyone that did one of these ads, and Avril Lavigne isn't one of them. So why do so many of us remember her in one of these ads? People have gone through the backlogs of these Got Milk ads, and there is nothing even similar to what we're describing. I wish I had the answers, but I don't. Either it existed, and somehow all evidence of it has been deleted or lost, or she never actually had a Got Milk ad, and all of us are somehow simply misremembering the exact same thing. So what do you think? Let me hear it in the comments below. We're looking at a song from 1993 whose title is confusing a lot of people online. The artist is an American rapper named Ice Cube, and the title of the song is Which of These? It Was a Good Day, or Today Was a Good Day. This song is Ice Cube's highest charting single ever. In 2008, the song was ranked number 28 on VH1's 100 Greatest Hip Hop Songs. Well, as it turns out, it's called It Was a Good Day. What did you say? Did you say it was a good day, or did you say today was a good day? Are you one of the many rap aficionados out there that guessed it right? Or have you seemingly said it wrong for years? Let me hear it in the comments below. This video's topic is not a Mandela effect in the traditional sense, because it isn't a massive group of people remembering something. 
This time, it's only one person. But what this one person remembers is fascinating and worthy of discussion because it all relates. Today, we're talking about the song Friday, I'm in Love by The Cure. Originally written and performed by Robert Smith and released in 1992, this song has quite the mystery surrounding its origin. Apparently, Robert Smith had a hard time believing he actually came up with the song Friday, I'm in Love. He believed that he had heard this song somewhere and that it was simply stuck in his head. In his mind, the song already existed. In 2008, he was quoted saying, I mean, Friday in Love is not a work of genius. It's almost a calculated song. Since he believed that song already existed, he asked bandmates if they had heard of it. All of them said no. It was like the song just appeared out of nowhere. Robert Smith continues, It's a really good chord progression. I couldn't believe no one else had ever used it, and I asked so many people at the time. I was getting drug paranoia anyway. I must have stolen this from somewhere. I couldn't have possibly come up with this. Robert Smith reached out to other musically inclined friends to see if they could help him uncover where this melody came from. He said, I asked everyone I knew. Everyone. I'd phone people up and sing it to them and go, have you heard this before? What's it called? They'd go, no, no, I haven't heard it. On the same album, there were songs which I'd slaved over, and I thought at the time were infinitely better, but Friday is probably the song off the Wish album that's THE song. Another interesting detail regarding Friday I'm in Love is that it was recorded in the key of D major, but the recorded version was sped up by a quarter tone. In fact, it's the only song in the album Wish that isn't in concert pitch, so it sounds so different compared to everything else. So not only did Robert Smith feel like he heard this song somewhere else, it also sounded like nothing else The Cure had made by that point. This could lead to the conclusion that the song was indeed copied from someone else, but no evidence has ever been brought to light to make that claim. No other version of the song has ever been found, and Robert Smith still swears he heard the song somewhere else. So what's going on? We don't really have a term to describe a personal Mandela effect, but it sounds like Robert Smith really did go through one, whatever it is that we decide to call it. Amazingly enough, this isn't the first time that a popular song was created like this. Apparently, a very similar thing happened to Paul McCartney of the Beatles. One morning he woke up and played a melody that kept playing over and over in his head. It was a song he swore he heard somewhere, but he couldn't place it. As he effortlessly wrote out the song, he became convinced that he was ripping off someone else, but everyone that he played it for had never heard of it. Originally, the words he used to keep the melody were, Scrambled eggs, Linda has such lovely legs. Over time, Paul McCartney wrote out and improved the lyrics to the song that would eventually become Yesterday, one of the most popular Beatles songs ever. Strangely enough, that concept and the name Yesterday became a major motion picture called Yesterday, released in 2019, with the premise that the band The Beatles never existed, but this one guy remembers them, completely, like it was yesterday, pun intended. That entire movie took the idea of having a personal Mandela effect and expanded upon the hypothetical of it. Imagine you knowing something that no one else has ever heard of. What do you do? Do you go crazy? Do you try to explain yourself to the world? Or do you reproduce all of the Beatles songs yourself and gain worldwide acclaim? I'm actually curious to hear what you would do in that situation. Anyway, all of this is so bizarre. Did Robert Smith and or Paul McCartney simply come up with something from nothing? Did they copy someone else? Was it really just a melody in their head? Or was it something else entirely? In 1997, the song Barbie Girl was released by the group Aqua. Described as insanely catchy, this song about using Barbie in twisted ways gained massive popularity in the UK, Australia, and the United States. Since this song is well known, help me out with these lyrics. I'm a Barbie girl in blank Barbie world. Is it a Barbie world or is it the Barbie world? The correct lyric is I'm a Barbie girl in the Barbie world. Did you get that right? Or are you really confused right now? December is here, and like many, Christmas is on my mind. So let's make a Christmas video. Obviously, decorations and colder weather are a part of the season, but so is Christmas shopping, if you participate in that. I did most of my shopping online, but just to feel nostalgic, I went and visited some physical stores. Now, as I walked around one of these dying ancient retail monuments, I noticed something that really confused me. I heard a classic song playing over the speaker in a department store. Upon hearing the song, I got a little confused. Up on the housetop, reindeer paws. Up on the housetop? I always thought it was up on the rooftop. So I went and looked it up, and here are the results. Up on the housetop is a Christmas song by Benjamin Hanby in 1864. Now, if you're like me, you remember it being up on the rooftop. So, did it change? 
Are there variations of it, or is this an example of the Mandela Effect? Well, we're going to get into that, but first a quick and tragic history lesson about Benjamin Hanby. Why, you might ask? Well, I'm in a giving mood, and what's better than an interesting backstory? Benjamin Hanby was born in Rushville, Ohio, to a local bishop by the name of William Hanby, who was involved in the administration of the Underground Railroad. If you don't know what that was, the Underground Railroad in America was a network of people, both black and white, offering aid and shelter to escaped slaves from the South. Benjamin Hanby vehemently opposed slavery, which made it difficult for him to blend into the more conservative fraternity that the church attracted. Not only that, once he took over his father's church, he ran into a lot of trouble. Because he had alternative views on church music compared to what was deemed acceptable at the time, as well as how to educate children. Because he failed at keeping his position in numerous churches, Benjamin had trouble providing for his wife and children. There was one point in time where he wrote a song called Darling Nellie Gray, which he sent the manuscript of to a publisher called the Oliver Ditson Company of Boston. He assumed that the song had been rejected until he heard his sister singing it at a recital. It was soon discovered that the Oliver Ditson Company had published the song under Hanby's name, but claimed the copyright for themselves. So Hanby sued the firm, but only won $50, which is about $1,560 today, as well as 12 free copies of sheet music. Benjamin eventually ran a singing school and crafted music for the John Church Music Company, but he still didn't make enough money to take care of his family. When it was all said and done, Benjamin Hanby ultimately crafted and published over 80 songs, but passed away at the young age of 33 from tuberculosis. Like so many great artists throughout history, he wasn't truly recognized during his lifetime. Now that you have the background on Benjamin Hanby, let's get to the bottom of this mystery surrounding his song. Upon doing some research, the first thing I found was an article called Up on the Rooftop on a website called christmasheadquarters.com. Okay, this sounds promising. I mean, christmasheadquarters.com? That sounds pretty official to me. Then I read it. Throughout the article, the writer calls it Up on the Rooftop, but the embedded YouTube video says Up on the Housetop. Huh? How could you not notice that difference? You put the video in your article. The article even says Up on the Rooftop was written by Benjamin Hanby. If you click on his name, it takes you to the Wikipedia page for him, where it says he composed Up on the Housetop. Why does the name keep changing? Was it written to be Housetop? Or was it written to be Rooftop? Well, apparently, the original lyrics are as follows. Up on the house, no delay, no pause. Clatter the steed of Santa Claus. Down throw the chimney with loads of toys. Ho for the little ones, Christmas joys. I'm gonna be honest, the shorter version right there, I think that's incredible. I think we should all just sing that instead. Anyway, apparently it wasn't ever Rooftop. And as for Housetop, that's only in the name of the song. In the original lyrics, it only ever says House. So what do you think about all this? Or does it even matter? Is this just the song that changed over time? Just like how people in different parts of the world use different colloquial phrases, such as Housetop or Rooftop, and because of that, the lyrics changed over time? Or would you attribute this to the Mandela Effect? Next up, we're talking about The Safety Dance by Men Without Hats. This 1982 classic is known for its catchiness and its medieval-inspired music video. Most known for its repeated pop culture phrase, blank can dance if blank want to, blank can leave your friends behind. Sound familiar? Well, here's our Mandela Effect question. Is it, you can dance if you want to, you can leave your friends behind? Or is it, we can dance if we want to, we can leave your friends behind? The correct answer is, we can dance if we want to. We can leave your friends behind. Is that what you remember? Some people online seem to remember it as, you can dance if you want to, at one point in the song, and then later it becomes, we can dance if we want to. But that simply isn't the case. As of now, it was never you. It has always been we. Another weird detail is that some people seem to remember this song being more peppy and lively, but now it's pretty monotone, almost spoken. If you've got another tab open, you should definitely look up the safety dance and tell me your thoughts. The last piece of residue for this song is really confusing. Is it possible the original band that created this song misremembers their own lyrics? Well, if you go to the band's own website, safetydance.com, it begins with a quote. Nearly 40 years ago, they told the world, you can dance if you want to, and the world listened. Uh, what? You supposedly said we can dance if we want to, not you can dance. And after reading through a few paragraphs, the website ends with, you still can dance if you want to. And Men Without Hats still makes it easy and fun. Britney Spears, the world famous pop singer, songwriter, and dancer who blew up the charts in the late 1990s and early 2000s, has popped up a lot recently in the news. 
Most notably though, because she is the subject of a high profile and court mandated conservatorship and has controlled the vast majority of her life and finances for the past 13 years. The reason I bring up all these details regarding Britney Spears is because of this heightened media presence, a lot more people have recently been taking a closer look at Britney Spears' life and music. And somewhere along the line, people started noticing some changes from what they remember, specifically in regards to her music videos. This is where the Mandela Effect comes in, and I'm curious to hear what you all remember and what you all think. In the 2000 music video for the song Oops I Did It Again, Britney Spears dances and sings along to her song while wearing a very memorable skin-tight red outfit. The Mandela Effect here is regarding her headset microphone. An unbelievable amount of people online remember this microphone, but as of now, it doesn't exist. Think back to that music video and tell me what you remember. Personally speaking, I wasn't a fan of her music growing up, but my sister was, so I inadvertently heard all of her songs hundreds of times. It felt unavoidable at that time. So that explains the huge volume of people who remember this specific detail. Now, let's be real for a second. A missing headset microphone in and of itself is weird, but it's hardly a mind-blowing Mandela effect. But it gets deeper. People have scoured the internet looking for residue and proof of its existence. And you know what? A lot has been found. Let's check it out. Some of the first things found were photos of people who dressed up as Britney Spears for Halloween or costume parties. Of these mini photos, quite a few of them are wearing the red outfit and the now missing headset microphone as part of their costume. It's strange that these people who went all in on getting the look just right accidentally included a headset microphone that she apparently never wore. Weird, right? More interesting still is that the officially released Oops I Did It Again doll of Britney Spears that released in 2000 also had a headset microphone. There was also a deluxe version of the doll that came with a CD of the song also included a headset microphone. Again, it's a weird detail to include considering the original music video apparently never had a headset microphone. It's just everyone seems to think it did for some reason. So next we have a collectible Funko Pop figure of Britney Spears in her red outfit making a pose. This pop figure was first released January 2021. Situations like this are super fascinating to me because so much can be drawn from this. Think about it. We have a toy from when the music video was originally released with a headset mic and now a new toy many years later without one. Meaning the Mandela effect happened sometime between those 20 years. Or everyone is misremembering the music video and she never had a headset microphone. Everyone is wrong. The dolls are wrong. The costumes are wrong, all the thousands of comments on internet threads, and Funko Pop simply did the research and made their pop figure according to the actual music video. There are just so many possibilities. If the video somehow did change because of the Mandela Effect, then Funko Pop isn't actually wrong in making a figure without a headset mic. They checked the video and said, okay, no mic. So again, I have to ask you, what do you remember? Another interesting bit of residue fans uncovered or remembered was from the Disney Channel original series Lizzie McGuire. In an episode titled Picture Day, released in 2001, Lizzie McGuire dressed as Britney Spears from the Oops I Did It Again music video, complete with a headset mic. Let's take a look. It'd be so Oops I Did It Again. Mom! Dad! Lizzie's talking about dressing like Britney Spears! Not a problem. I can possibly look like Britney for at least five more years and like five million sit-ups. This fun Venn diagram of Britney Spears fans and Mandela Effect enthusiasts have poured into the comment section of the official music video and have scoured every single frame of it looking for residual details to put their minds at ease. There is nothing worse than feeling crazy, knowing something for sure only to be completely wrong. At least all of those fans can rest easy in the comfort that so many other people remember the headset microphone just like them. After digging long enough, something interesting was finally noticed. There is a moment in the music video where it looks like Britney Spears is adjusting the headset microphone. It isn't a strange action to adjust a headset microphone during intense choreography or while moving around performing, but it is strange for your hand to adjust a headset microphone that isn't there. So let's take a look at that and tell me what you think. Are people looking too hard at this, or is there something there? Along with the Oops I Did It Again music video, there is a behind the scenes making of video. There isn't a headset microphone shown or used at any point. If it was there, it isn't there now. So let's talk about some possible explanations. I have five explanations for you. You could agree, you could disagree, maybe you have your own explanation. But these are the ones that I came up with. 
Number one, people are remembering a different live performance or music video where Britney Spears is using a headset microphone and they're mixing it up with this one. Number two, the doll I talked about earlier was incorrect, but still inspired Lizzie McGuire and tons of fans out there that a headset microphone existed when it in fact did not. Number three, this is all a mass confabulation that thousands and thousands of people are all experiencing randomly at the same time. Number four, somehow the headset microphone was retroactively removed from the music video and the behind the scenes video, but no other form of media. And number five, this is a Mandela effect. The headset mic at some point was real and plenty of people remember it, but now it simply doesn't exist. What do you think? Stuff like this is especially compelling because kids and fandoms go hand in hand. Like I said earlier, Britney Spears wasn't my fandom as a kid, but rather Pokemon. I knew their names, numbers, type, moves, when they evolved. It was ridiculous how much my dumb child brain memorized regarding what I was passionate about. In fact, there is a 2019 Stanford research study that studied these effects. Long story short, with a ton of details omitted to keep this short, they determined that kids at an early age who extensively played Pokemon actually developed a region of their brain to categorize and organize all of these little pocket monsters. Whereas kids who did not play Pokemon extensively did not. All this to say, kids and their fandoms are a beast when it comes to memory. So much so, our brains become permanently altered to remember and categorize as much as possible about said fandoms. Kids easily become obsessed with stuff like that, and that knowledge is typically for life. As an adult, I don't need to know that some random Pokemon like Charmeleon evolves at level 36 into Charizard, but it's there, and I can't delete it. And just like that, the seemingly obscure detail of Britney Spears wearing a headset microphone in the Oops I Did It Again music video? Well, I'm gonna trust the experts. The point I'm getting at is when thousands and thousands of kids who were mega fans of Britney Spears grow up and tell me there was without a doubt a headset microphone, who am I to question them? Village People was a popular 1970s and 80s American disco group. They were most well known for their outfits and their songs like YMCA and In the Navy. I'm bringing them up today because the group was known for having each member take on a traditionally masculine role. For example, there was a cop, a cowboy, etc. So here is where the Mandela Effect comes in. How many people are in the village people? Is it five people? Or is it six people? As it typically goes, groups like this have five members. Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Spice Girls, the list goes on. But in this case, it's actually six people, not five. Now here is where things get weird. But now includes an army guy as the sixth character. Including an army guy might not initially seem weird, until you realize that their song in the Navy was such a smash hit that the United States Navy wanted to make it their theme song and use it in recruiting ads. Think about it, the Navy wouldn't have been cool with an army guy being the face of the group. It just doesn't make any sense. Overall, this Mandela effect is pretty weird. When you look at the group photos of the village people, it just seems off. It seems like there's an extra friend there just pretending to be a part of the group. So let me know what you think about this in the comments below. I'm very curious to hear what everyone else says. On June 1st, 2008, there was a major fire that broke out in Universal Studios in Hollywood, California. This major fire burnt down the King Kong theme park attraction and a bunch of previously preserved video content. A huge amount of articles and videos just released announcing that an estimated half a million popular song masters going back six decades were also all destroyed. Here is where the Mandela Effect comes in. None of the artists, musicians, producers, or mixers knew about this. Not a single one. These poor musicians are finding out for the first time that their master recordings were destroyed 11 years ago. Now, legal action is being sought by a number of artists. So, how is it possible that this massive media corporation, Universal Music Group, was able to conceal this major devastating loss for over a decade? That's one of the big mysteries of all of this, and I think that's why it ties back into the Mandela Effect. But before we get to that, these aren't simply small bands and artists either. We're talking about R.E.M., Tom Petty, Jimmy Buffett, Aerosmith, Nirvana, Al Green, No Doubt, Nine Inch Nails, Tupac, even Snoop Dogg. Thousands and thousands more. Here's what is so confusing to me. Over half a million of these masters were lost, but not a single artist requested access to their original masters over the 11 years. No one sampled any of those clips in 11 years. No one ever happened to look inside the vault containing priceless amounts of music, even once over the course of over a decade? I'm sorry, I'm not buying it. 
This feels exactly like the Black Tom explosion where history has somehow been rewritten, retconned, and now we all have to adapt to the strange change in history that no one noticed or talked about for 11 years, but now we all know to be true, somehow. To quote one of the articles I read, the scale of the losses is staggering. Upon digging in deeper into this, I actually found some other interesting facts. For one, all the way back in 2008, after the fire, most of the news reports focus exclusively on the loss of the video vault. And the New York Times even went as far as saying, the blaze was a close call, and only a few video and television images were lost. In no case was the destroyed material the only copy of a work. That's a pretty bold statement considering now over half a million popular songs masters were burnt up and destroyed. So many, in fact, that they don't even have a full collection list of what was destroyed. The last little bit of this fascinating Mandela effect I'm going to share with you are some of the reactions by some of the artists that were actually affected by this. The biggest disaster in the history of the music business was only discovered 11 years after the fact. What do you think? In the past, I talked about a Britney Spears Mandela effect and her missing headset microphone. But today we're talking about a different effect. This time we're talking about Britney's skirt in the Hit Me Baby One More Time music video. Think back to that video if you've ever seen it. I'm sure a lot of you have. Back then it was honestly hard to avoid. You can probably visualize the outfit in your mind. So here is the Mandela effect. Describe the skirt that she is wearing in the music video. Go ahead, I'm listening. Most of you probably said it was a plaid skirt. As it is now, it turns out that it isn't a plaid skirt at all. It is now simply a black skirt. When I first heard of this, I remembered it being plaid as well, but I was never a huge fan of hers. I asked a couple of friends and all of them said plaid as well. So what about you? What do you remember? What kind of skirt was Britney Spears wearing in her Hit Me Baby One More Time music video? I'm actually pretty excited to hear your responses in the comments because this one has made a lot of noise online, so let's settle it once and for all. Let's go back in time to when breakdancing first started. Most people believe that breakdancing started in the late 1970s and early 1980s in New York City. I'm pretty sure that's what you remember as well, right? Early hip hop culture and that style of dancing were intertwined together, but now it seems that breakdancing's origins have been rewritten. In fact, we now have evidence of breakdancing all the way back in the 1930s. Yes, the 1930s, 40 years before its reported origin. I'm not joking, I'm not pulling your leg. Here is a video clip of people breakdancing all the way back in the 1930s. Prepare to have your minds thoroughly confused. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but then again, a lot of this doesn't make sense to begin with. So I'm gonna post the link to the full video in the description box below. Be sure to check it out. It's a very strange video. For our final Mandela effect, we are looking at the classic song, Billie Jean by Michael Jackson. Right before the chorus starts, there's a verse that says, people always told me, be careful of what you do and don't go around breaking young girls' hearts. And blank always told me, be careful who you love. What goes in the blank? Is it? Mother always told me be careful who you love? Or is it Mama always told me be careful who you love? I don't know what you chose, but the answer is indeed Mother, not Mama. So it's Mother always told me to be careful of who you love, not Mama always told me to be careful of who you love. I originally heard of this in a subreddit and I had to play the song right away to hear if it actually was Mother. It turns out it is indeed Mother. Is that what you remember? I'm super curious to hear what everyone says in the comments below.